Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Now, today we have... Jim Stackpole, and this is a interview that I've been looking forward to. I've been, you know, we've been sort of back and forth a little bit um, for I don't know, maybe six months or something like that. But we finally got you on the ferry to to join us here in our Customs House. So thanks for coming. Pleasure, good to be here. Um, now I was talking with Dave Carney the other day, and he was uh, he was telling me that back in the early two thousands, he was one of your pupils. And I said to him, if you could ask Jim Stackpole one question, what would it be? And he said, after thinking on it for a second, he goes, well, the Royal Commission is a result of essentially the industry not paying attention to what Jim's been saying for a while. <laughs> That's a pretty big compliment. And, uh, and I said, okay, um, go on. He goes, the certainty of advice, right, which is mm-hmm. what you've been sort of talking about for a while now. Um, and his question was, well, why do you think, why do you think it's come to this and the industry as a whole couldn't cut it off, cut off the problem before it became a problem? What's your opinion? Yeah, great question. I think the, um, industry really has its uh, origins from product-based distribution and we, we need products, you know, we all need products to run our lives. Um, and but over a period of time, that distribution model gathered so much momentum and so much. This is just the way it's done. That that the paradigms that then were built out of it in institutional land or union super world or uh, product world, whatever, all just started to feed on itself. And I, I think most people in the industry, actually, I'm sure most people in the industry join the industry because they want to help people make better decisions with their money, their lives, so that everyone's got noble causes, I would say. And every industry has got its those on the side that don't do it for that, but they're the minority. However, how it got out of hand is that for so long we've just believed, and really it's only probably been 20 or 30 years, but for so long we've just believed this is the way it's done. And every everyone thought, that well it'll continue and yeah it'll sharpen up and technology will sharpen up and and comp- competition may sharpen up a bit and uh, there'll be smarter products out there but uh, what was obviously building and not just in fin services but in the environment um, in in government um, in automotive industries in retail industries is just the power of the consumer and thanks to the politicalization of most causes the only reason we got a royal commission is because a a minority national party senator had the voice that the prevailing government needed and so okay i'll agree to do this royal commission thanks to consumerism and so there's not i don't think any one point that was because the product guys got out of hand or that the service guys got out of hand or the regulators were just wanted to find a new fight I think it's a whole coalescence that's happening not just in fin services but everywhere on the political and industrial and professional landscape. It's inevitable that change is going to come and maybe it might blindside us a bit. The thing I... Long-winded answer, I'm sorry, Clayton, but the thing no. I'm interested, really interested in, because I'm probably anal and anything else, is that the report that the Royal Commission was based upon, 499, ASIC report... That was out for two or three years before the Royal Commission. And there was already remuneration in place with the major banks to pay, in the millions at the time, penalties for fee-for-no-service. 
and looking through all the staff that created the headlines, that had already been brought up two or three years ago. They were effectively shooting fish in a bucket that was well and clearly known. But the fact that it got to the headlines, I think, was actually brought about by a media industry really keen for some gist to get their teeth into. And now the remuneration's in the billions and banks are exiting wealth. Yes. Interesting. It's, I think the last count, I could be wrong here, but it, if I was to tally up all the billions and all the headlines... It was, I think, above five billion dollars. Mm, yeah, <laughs> you know I mean, it is more money now. I've heard that five thousand people now work in remediation. Wow! And if you think about, you know, we've seen about that number drop out of advice this year. I wonder what percentage <laughs> of those people are making a lateral move like that. Um, so, if if you were to think about it. Uh, your belief is the rise of the consumer is, uh, you know, across the landscape, across industries, um, and advice. We we see it because we're in it every day, but it's actually a, a wider movement. Oh, that question. You know, we we haven't got the monopoly on this one. Yeah. Uh, and I think be careful the unintended consequences of what's coming around the corner. I, I think a lot of advisors are thinking, oh God, I've just got to get through this fascia, one exam or ten, whatever it is, and I'll be right. He said, no, you know, I, I, we, we're only just starting to see the start of the inevitability. And whether, you're, whether I'm selling cars or I'm selling tomatoes or whether I'm, I'm, I'm going for health services for my aged care or myself, the rise and rise of the consumer demand movement and the rise, therefore, of new markets to serve that consumer is the rate of change is only going to keep changing. Um, something I've stumbled upon recently is... I'm not sure if you've heard this term. No one I've spoken to has heard this term, but it's a, a digital money manager. Uh, it's coming out of the UK. You're probably more aware than I that they went through something similar uh, a few years ahead of us, and uh, they saw a lot of advisors leave advice, and that created the environment that's just probably a few years ahead of Australia. And this term that I've seen come out is digital money manager. Um, really aligns with this concept of consumer driven uh unlicensed education so uh the way that uh my my research tells me is that essentially the premise is um as the digital money manager you accept that your client will have a growing list of uh fintech apps let's call it on their phone to to help them manage their money and then it's your job to not recommend them but to uh give um sort of a little bit more guidance and filling in the gaps for them because something like say pocketbook is going to tell you where your money is gone but it's not going to teach you the emotional uh, engagement people have with their money so we all but, which is the major problem with fintech products as a whole it's they're always developed to solve rational problems whereas money is an emotional um, even though it's dollar figures and it's very emotional thing so um so this di- concept of digital money manager it is going to save advisors what fifty, sixty thousand dollars at the moment per year um to be unlicensed uh pivoting to start using where the world is headed and I think to myself, if 15% of Australians can get advice now, increased costs is just going to eat into that. So then maybe we're only going to have 10% of the population that uh, can afford advice. And so that's a huge gap now in the market of about 5% of people who have traditionally been willing to pay for advice and willing to have an advisor that an advisor can no longer sufficiently uh, uh, service and they're currently without an advisor. One of the interesting things Andrew Inwood was saying that about 500,000 clients are out there right now that used to have an advisor but because all the banks got out of wealth then they're just floating around and I thought that's a, it's just a, such an unbelievably large um, market to go after. So what do you think about this concept? And, and we haven't seen it yet the idea of the rise of the financial educator or the digital money manager from moving away from 
you know, from advisors that say, I'm, I'm tapping out of the current situation and I'm interested in pursuing something that's a little bit around the edges? Wow, great question. Three things, I think, for me. Going back to your initial comments, I think we worked in the UK about 20 years ago. And so we were doing going over with, with Instos. We used to take money from Instos, which stopped about seven or eight years ago. And I don't think RDR and what the, you, what the mis-selling of pensions in the late 80s, I don't think it was similar to us. And so I think the dangers, I believe at least, the dangers of comparison of, well, this has happened elsewhere, therefore this might, the consequences will be so similar here. I think that's a danger. I, and we've taken groups to the US and been work with a, had a number of alliances with US firms as well. And I, I keep coming back to Australia after these trips and thinking, you know what, we're a bit different again. And so it's the, 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 I think we can always learn from any market. Don't get me wrong. You know, we can, in the cream of any market, you, wherever they are, you can learn stuff. But I think the massive consequences of decisions that have been made, this, then that, which is, I think, are being used to convince boards and groups and and leave with the logic and, you know, the old, you never get fired for hiring IBM because they should know what's going on. I think there's a danger in that. I think we're at the vanguard for a number of reasons. We've got a small population. We've got a really big competitive marketplace. We've got an egalitarian population. Um, we've got a well, well-informed and educated population. We've got a national law, not state-based laws. All these reasons, I just think we're a bit different. So that's the first point. Second point is the... The whole question about we're only servicing 15% of Australians today with advice, I think, has to be looked through the product prism. And so the the, the debate is, has been around um, the current model is not supporting the majority of Australians. The more current model, therefore, needs to be changed in some way, shape or form. And we have to increase the reach of, a, of, of, of affordable advice for Australians. Which, you know, again... I think if you look at, you know, 30 years ago, how we bought our coffee and today how we buy our coffee, or it's not a question of affordability, it's a question of value, what we, what we value. And what I think the, the product origins of the industry have done to so many great advisors, it's reduced their value proposition and how much they get paid to how much product they supply. Mm-hmm. Not to really the the really quality of the advice. I can give great advice to somebody that doesn't need a product and it's very valuable. Absolutely. Similarly, I can give a lousy product. It's not worth its funds under management pricing and I still get the same fee. The disconnect, the prism I think we need to really challenge looking forward is more about what's the value of the advice and then let's make it affordable as compared to let's make more advice affordable for more Australians. Because the commoditization of advice, um, we're seeing it happen in medicine, to six minute units and yeah i'm sure a version of that will happen here as it will anywhere but despite all the apps we can get for our for instance like medicine for our health for instance despite all the sites we can go to to learn about despite dr google you know we're not living living any healthier um and, and so i think the availability of more and more apps to potentially fill this affordability question uh I think it's a road well travelled and it's going to end up on a roundabout. I don't think really Australians are going to get more valuable advice because I can give it cheaper with more commoditisation. I think, and so when you then look at the whole distribution scheme through that, um, and back in the old days, it's not long ago, I suppose, when the battle used to be who's got the biggest distribution chain, it used to be PIS against the AMP and how many registered reps have you have got and how many files have those reps got against the wall that... They're earning money off whether they see them or not. All those old days about the numbers tell the story as compared to the quality tells the story. So it's firstly dangerous to compare in such rapid changes of time to other markets where I'm not too sure if it's a good comparison. Secondly, I think the debate being about making advice affordable is a very product-centric and logical debate. You know, we're just well, Disney's just released streaming at six ninety nine US per month to undercut netflix knock yourself out boys and we're all winners for that absolutely you know but when you're talking about people's lives and something you extend that you're talking about people's marriages you're talking about people's jobs you're talking about people's confidence in keeping a job or getting another job you're talking about people's desires for their family to look after their kids or their aged parents and you're talking about things that aren't just about a streaming service 
and you're talking about commoditizing it in such a way they get really valuable advice i still think most of us despite you know it's 2019 heading into 2020 most of us still think of a product solution as compared to an advisory solution which i don't care if this product attached or not um so values first um robo advice yeah it'll be enabler it'll be an important enabler in comparison to other marketplaces i'm not so sure in these times like today and i think it will be a an innovator or some left field unintended consequence of fascia or regulation or whatever they'll start saying oh this is totally different hmm. I don't know if that answers your question no it does um yeah I, I probably have been without thinking about it too much just assuming that we would replicate the uk but you're you're sort of suge- suggesting that that's not a perfect analogy oh, i don't think so you know i think in talking to uk and, and talked to uh, Phil Bellingham last week is out for the FPA this week. You know, I, we both agreed, and having been in contact for a number of years, that really nothing's really different. You know, I don't think I think people in the UK need advice. People in the US, anywhere, they all need advice. But I would still say that ninety percent of people who sit down across from an advisor saying, "Now, my investment returns. Now, my tax return. You know, now uh, we need to keep insurance going because it really cost me a lot of money." And we're not talking about that emotional side that you touched on, which is, you know, I just can't save, you know, or, you know, I just mm. can't get an agreement with my business partners about where we need to be spending money, you know, or I know I'm going to bring this topic up because I'm really stuck in a job. I really haven't got the confidence to go out and do it myself somewhere else. And I haven't got a plan or a partner or someone to do that. And the accountant might be good at it, but the accountant, the poor buggers, they themselves have sort of got a wrong model. Absolutely. Pricing it on the effort they give. Yeah. And, you know, not many... I just don't think that model is is immune to the same sort of, maybe not as visible changes that Finn Services is going through, but that model has to reinvent itself too around what's valued to the client, not their tax return, because that's going to get commoditized. Oh, I, I, even the Baz actually. The other yeah. day I sent, I, I had a, a new entity and I said, I, um, it, I sent an email to my accountant. I said, mate, can you uh, just do a couple of Bazes for me? And I got this... Um, Thirteen hundred dollar, you know, quote, and I just went, "Oh man, I'm just going to pull out the skills I, as a former tax accountant and just get it done myself." And then I called up the ATO and said, "Hey, can you send the little pink forms?" And they said, "Actually, you can go onto my gov now." Mm. And I said, "Okay." And they're like, "Yeah, just uh, click on this button here, and that's your your buzz." And you know, a, it was a very simple. Um, it probably took me. Um, mate five ten minutes mm. and but yeah so for the accountants to have to compete against that that's that's a very tricky um, it's not a game it's not a game you want to play yeah 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 you know you go on it before you pay the rent absolutely um so one of the going back to what dave was talking about um so you've got uh, it's the certainty of advice right that's that's the message you've been sending yeah look we, we 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 i was a fan of a standard called accounting professional ethical standard 230 so this is a thing called aps 230 2012 it came through right it was championed actually in 2008 2006 around about the gfc time it was called at the time ap12 so it's had a long heritage it's been a long time it was put forward by the Accounting Professional and Ethical Standards Board. Yeah, it's called the APESB. Um, and it's probably an invisible board to most of us, but they set basically the standards for every practicing accountant in Australia. Right. So if you're going to do sales tax, this is the approach. If you're going to take an approach to... They, they put out governing rulings and bodies and have all these different standards, which accountants by there, whether they're certified CPA, cert, cert, uh, cert, uh, um chartered accountants they follow the standards so the standards boards got together 2010 or 2008 and it would work through a number of iterations but basically 2012 we got involved they asked us to say what well, we're thinking of bringing in a standard that removes any form of trial commission on any form of product so funds under management but no trials um, insurance no commissions for anyone that's practicing accounting and delivering financial advice under a financial advice services license and they said to us is it possible to do it because we're having feedback strongly that it's not it'll send everyone out of business and so we did some work for them we interviewed all the major suppliers at the time um, and we came out fundamentally finding that 
down deep in the basement of most of the main institutions under the cover of the wraps and under the sheets and in the dust covers protected by an armed guard at the door with dogs on the bolt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over-dramatising it. But anyway, they had these products that didn't have trials attached and they, but they didn't have commissions attached. And so, yeah, we can do it. But the rollout to our current distribution group would be a significant, significant change if we were to sort of roll this stuff out because all the products out at the time had a... People were charging 100 basis points, 200 basis points, not even level commissions on products and things like that. Um, and so it was, yeah, we've got them, and we've always had them just in case we need them. <laughs> and, you know, again, I didn't go down to the basement and check them out, and I, I'm not an advisor. but So they said it'll be a significant change, but we're ready for it. So we went back and said, look, and we obviously had been biased on the other side, saying, well, we're working with advisors every day who are out there simply charging retainer fees in flat dollars and giving back all commissions where they could. Uh, some products you can't, well, yep. now you can. Giving back all trails and just charging a flat fee. And that's, that's the advisors we work with. That's our model. And so we presented it. And the standard got passed. It was actually passed. Uh, and, it, and they had a five-year lead-in period. And we thought, great, you know, this is really good. This is a great initiative. The accountants are going to stand out. Um, and maybe the others will follow. Maybe not. Who cares? But the market will figure it out. Three months later, it was overturned. It was overturned. The standards body changed back and reverted and watered down the standard and said, you can still do whatever you want to do, but just make a note in your FSG or wherever to say the standard. They've been lobbied. Yeah. They've been lobbied by the predominantly strong dealer groups at the time who had a lot of accounting slash financial planning, who had a lot of valuation models in place, joint venture arrangements with accounting and financial oh, yeah. planning firms. And I can understand that. But the fact that the board co- went back against the standard and watered it down, which I would challenge never done before, that got my goat up. Um, and ever since, I wanted to create a standard. And we took us four years, but we got it last year. I uh, got it this year, sorry. Got it this year after four years of work through uh, IP Australia and H- ACCC. And it's just like, you know, like there's a standard on electricity labelling when you buy electricity. There's a standard on fuel grading. There's a stand- We've got a standard for advice that just mimics APS 230. That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Mm. Um, so then now that you've done this, uh, is the goal to get public awareness? The uh, goal is to... The goal is simply to for those advisory firms that are that are following a standard, they want to meet and talk about how, as a group of advisory firms, they could better deliver as per the standard. Yeah. And, and every every firm client has got a mixture of clients. You know, some they've inherited, some they're getting today, some they've 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 bought, and no two clients are the same. And in depending upon the size of firm, there's a lot of heritage and legacy promises and propositions out there. But fundamentally, the standard gives some advisors who are interested in it, the opportunity to take some of their clients, those that they wanted to take to a new standard, across to a, a way of charging, presenting um, their proposition, delivering on their proposition, and having a forum to say, well, how do we go about doing this stuff effectively? I think, I think that that forum itself is a true advice platform without technology to talk about how do you deliver valuable advice? One thing about the standard is that it is comprehensive in terms of the advice is not singular. We don't just do investment advice. We don't just do... The whole idea is the old Plato quote, we believe by the treating of the whole is going to have a much greater effect on the client's life than trying to just deal with the individual parts. Sure. So a certainty... So no scoping of advice, for example. The, the, the advice is just, we, we're here to play comprehensive advice. We yes. take that role of comprehensive advice. Yes. Um, as compared to, I'm an accountant, I only do the tax, or I'm, a, I'm an investment advisor, I only do the investment. If you're delivering to the standard, the, the, first, the first conversation is about our, our job is to maximise the probability of helping you achieve everything in your financial life. Um, and we want to have a broad conversation about what that means. Um, and that in itself has got some issues attached to it. We continue to talk. How do you actually do that? Because we used to think it was goals-based advice, outcomes-based advice, values-based advice. But it's not. It's, it's something that you just touched on before. It, it's the stuff that gets in our way in our lives, which is effectively our biggest, our biggest challenge, not just getting excited about the goals we can make. So we call it a complexity-based advice. Wow. And so this forum who are trying to attain to a standard, um, trying to run a business, trying to not work ridiculous hours every week, yep. trying to take a base of their clients across to it, meet and talk consistently about uh, case after case uh, to try to get a better handle. How can they now build a business that delivers to a 
the standard and commonality whilst recognising it's not scripts, it's simply just common frameworks. Um, when the basis for the charge in fees is really getting people through a complexity in their lives, whether it's behavioural, circumstantial or situational, obviously towards goals, but the goals really is not... It's, it's not, not everything. No, no I goals completely understand what you're saying. And, and I think this whole move, and AMP has been a great example, we've got this new goals-based centre, and oh, good luck, boys, you know. Oh, the, the amount of money that went into it. What's really interesting is you're describing, um, in a lot of ways, the new, well, well, certainly one interpretation of the new FASIA uh, standards. For example, you know, scoping is, is one interpretation, where scoping is totally uh, a no-go now. Um, one interpretation, which has sort of been countered now, but it, there was certainly concern that there was no commissions at all and, and things like that. So, uh, and, and it looks like they've sort of wound that back, so mm. to speak. Um, so would you say in a way that this, uh, and it's called certainty... Certainty advice. Certainty advice. Would you say that standard would be closer to the stricter... Uh, interpretation of fascia this is this is another rabbit hole for me and probably and I don't want to take the listeners down well maybe I do come on (laughs) I'm not a fan I'm not a big fan of the whole fascia stuff okay you know I just think I think fascia's rode in on a big horse and I'm all for people playing ethically and I'm all but I think there's going to be so many unintended consequences of this fascia I'm just this garbage i should say about standard three that's just been announced and you could drive a truck through it basically yeah it's the it's the writing of the code which essentially uh, in one interpretation would mean the the ability for legal action against you as a planner um yeah it's it's quite high i'm all for i am all for Standards, obviously, we've worked hard to get ours. Yeah. I'm all for education, and, and as I put every caveat, but I'm I'm not, and I, I, I and I just hate the tribalism that's going on at the moment. That unless you're for fast here against us, um, and I think who, who who's sending that message? Oh, I think I think the media, I think the press, right? right. I think the, um, I think it, it, the unfortunate situation we've got at the moment where FPA is up against AFA, up against FASIA recommendations, and we wanted to be a monitoring body. Now we're not. We're bitterly disappointed. And, oh, my God. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I just think the, 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 the reality of what happens between a client and an advisor across the desk every day and has been happening across the desk every day, the FASIA has got a lot of unintended consequences which are forcing a lot of people to take a higher ground now about this now has to be championed and this now has to be pushed at the sake of a lot of really valuable conversations that have happened for years and will happen for years by the majority of advisors who are ethical already and professional already. They may not be up to the education standards and some might say, well, bad luck, they've got to go. Um, Because I would say that if I presented to a client or if one of our advisors presented to a client a recommendation on how we may work together this year in terms of the, 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 the plan we hope, but there's no mention of any product in that recommendation. There's, there's no mention of a specific strategy in that document. It's simply saying we're going to work together, meet four times a year, talk about the con- complexities, make sure you're aligned to goals, bring in the experts, and if we do need specific bits of product recommendation, we'll draft an SOA as per FASIA standards. But that overall terms of engagement, it's not a FASIA document because there's no product in that. Yeah. And so can a client, can an advisor therefore get paid on a non-FASIA document, which we would call a terms of engagement, this yep. mentions no product whatsoever. Yes. Because one of our advisors came to us the other day and said, oh, Jim, our licensee said your stuff is non-regulated advice. I said, what? Yeah, well, he, they came to us saying, after listening to it, looking at it, your terms of engagements, because we, we help our clients draft their terms of engagements, we help our clients tr- price their terms of engagements, we help develop the, the strategy implementation, we, we build what we call an advice map, which puts the client's life on a single page, because that's the job of a good advisor, to keep it on a single page forever. We build an advice path, which shows in a graphically, again, the client's path for the next seven years. And we build all that stuff based upon our listening, or privacy obviously includes, we listen to the client's conversations between client and advisor, we play that strategy mode, we give the terms of engagement, no recommendations of a specific product. 
and this I want to have our advice come back said, well that's non regulated advice. And I said, What's regulated advice? <laughs> so that's when I'm talking specifically about this super fund or or this element of their estate or aged care. And I said, Well hang on. The the regulated advice sounds like a product recommendation to me. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. You know, and an unregulated advice sounds, sounds like, like advice. advice. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think and this is where for a whole host of reasons comparing, well, what this what happened in the UK and therefore this is what's gonna happen here. I think, well, I'm not sure about this stuff, you know. I think it's I think basically people people on the street, mum and dad, whoever it might be, they need advice when they're facing a complexity which by themselves they can't or won't address. They don't well, have to. Well articulated. You know, and I think the answer with a FASIA document and fact finds attached, I can understand it if I was sitting in the compliance document of the major banks. Compliance department, I should yes, say. Yes, yes, of course. But I can't understand it if I'm a great accountant or I'm a great advisor sitting with a client who's got a great issue and simply wants confidence, you know, or wants direction, or more importantly, wants just clarity around, do I really need A or B? I, I tell you what's super interesting, what's just dawned on me, is that do you have advisors that sign these terms of engagement and they do not provide an upfront SOA? Absolutely. Wow. All of them. Because when, wow. when, when do I need an SOA? I need an SOA when I've got a specific product need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that yeah, might yeah, be six yeah, months yeah, or 12 yeah, months yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, two yeah. years away. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a really good point. <laughs> but I think coming again from our, our product background, we're saying, well, how does a product, and how do I get advice out of a product? You don't. You know, it's, it's like a product is a scalpel in the hands of the surgeon yeah. that she pulls. Or, and I don't need to test how sharp it is. I just just make it work yes. some people really want to test how sharp it is and is it on the asx this or that and and you've got some and we've educated a whole generation now of clients by calling them investors they're not investors they're mums and dads trying to find the best path for them and their family and their kids and their aged parents and a part of that is investing it, part of that's investing yep. part of that's big part of that's cash flow yep. part of that might be risk part of that yes. might be I don't know, structures, part of that might be business, for yes. those running a business. Yes, a so- solving an argument between partners that they can't solve Look, themselves. And I think when you really start to see, if I can consistently, specifically and methodically identify the value our clients seek, identify the complexities they face, whether they're product related or not, and deliver it in such a way that makes me a profit and also is valuable to most of my clients, I can deliver any services down that channel. Absolutely. And so let's stop calling ourselves financial advisors or accountants and just say we're advisors. Mm. So I, the big picture for me is driven by your first comment, consumerism. I think we're heading into a new profession. I th- and I, you know, that's my pun. I think we're moving into an era that we're, we're going to have roles that probably, you know, like IT, hasn't really been invented yet, but the need for it is going to be huge. You know, our population's ageing, our choices are getting more and more wide and varied, our, our, our expectations about what we could earn or maybe not be able to earn, yet we are ill-equipped, we're, we're not wired for the financial decisions. And so being that mentor between the client's actual life and their financial life, being that invisible hand that pushes the clients or pulls the clients through tough conversations they've been putting off for years hoping that their it wife or their brother in will yeah. solve themselves, you yeah. know, being that being that person's got a bias towards action to make sure things get done because I'm just doing it in the best interest not because I get an extra product flog and I get on the next pina colada trip overseas because I've sold totally. so much product yeah 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 you know and I think this all these connotations that have been around since Adam played fullback for Jerusalem about what <laughs> makes a great advisor a great confidant without being a mate I just yep. it's commercial it's not social yes even though in the country it's harder to do that yes and I think these elements to deliver each client their unique certainty, as we call it, and their unique overcome their unique complexity, even to the fact of bringing in your significant other to meetings every year to talk about really what is of value to you. Because I've heard, I've met your partner many, many times. I've never met you. And it's like going to the dentist without your teeth, not bringing the other person in. That, well, how are they affecting this person's financial life? <laughs> Absolutely. I like what you just said before, delivering unique certainty through unique complexity. That is, that's a really good way to articulate advice. I, um, very similar thought patterns, just you, you've explored them so much deeper than I have, but this whole, whole idea that it's our job to deliver solutions uh, to financial problems um, and to receive a fee in return for that. And, and, and the, 
if you think of it in terms of say a, a bar a bar graph to deliver as much value as humanly possible and to receive as much value uh, because someone somewhere is uh, getting money from that client it might be the pizza shop down the road it might be Disney plus it might be school fees it might be the tax man um, so why would you not deliver more value so that advisors uh, receive more and deliver more that's to me a perfect scenario what's really interesting is I don't think I ever and it's kind of something I regret now I don't think I ever signed a terms of engagement and didn't start with an upfront piece of yeah, yeah. Well, but that's how we're trained. You know, I think that goes back to our paradigms, how we're trained in the yeah. product-based industry. Yeah. The first engagement was, and back in the old days, you've got to get their investments first. And it seems crazy. Money. If I think about it now, it's like it, it, we've just started this journey together and I'm putting this 30, 40, 50 page legal document in front of you while we're, while you're just still trying to remember what color my eyes are. Like we're, we're really early in this trust building uh, relationship it's kind of putting the cart before the horse a little bit. Uh, and I think when you get further away from it, um, it, it's more about what does the client value? Uh, and, and this is where, unfortunately, despite well over the, va- well, no, the vast majority of people become advisors to help people, yeah. they're then thrown into an environment, well, you know what, Jim, to get paid, you've got to put an SOA out there and get some product in place. Yeah. Well, why? Yeah. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Oh, or it's an alley right down the accountant. Oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's, hang on, we don't, we're not fans of alley rates, but the point is, is that what is the client value? And not just what they valued last year, what, what do they value this year? I don't go on last year's balance sheet, I don't get last year's salary statement or investment return. Why do I go on last year's understanding of what, what is their complexity this year? And I might, don't make that assumption. And I think my, all I'm getting at is that so much has been built and, and we've just take for granted in this industry because it's had a product-based origin, then really get back to, why did you get in this game? I yeah. got in this game to help people. Great, okay. Let's deliver more stuff that the client value. And if there's a product, let's do it with SOAs totally. and ROAs and everything. Yep. But if there's no product, then, you know, is your advice still valuable? And this is the nexus. This is the thing that really gives me is because so many of us have been doing it for so long, they don't value what they do. Ah, uh, Yeah. I've got to prove what I've done. Yeah, I've got to, yeah, yeah. Are they going to pay me 4000 now? Because they were paying me two. Yeah. Let's test it. Oh, God, no, I can't test it. <laughs> yeah, let's test it. Yeah. Well, I've been doing so much for so many for so long and getting paid a, a bit, but I know I've done too much for too many and not get it. But now test it. Yeah, let's test it. Who's coming in? The Joneses next week. Here's recording. Go and do it. Send us it. Let's give you a price. I can't charge them that. Why not? <laughs> you know, we, we priced 40 of them this week and they all went out roughly about that. Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> so this whole question of, I've been toes tied to, I did 10 hours work, let's, let's write it down to eight, I'm at 250 an hour, therefore it's X. Yes. Or I've been so tied to, you, know, you can't charge a, you know, a, a mum and dad that amount of money, you're ripping them off. Well, hang on, what's the value? Yeah, no, 100%. What, what are you doing in exchange? You know, I, I can go and buy a bloody Korean car and go from A to B, or I can buy a BMW and go from A to B. You're telling the people in the BMW they should buy a Korean? It's, it's this exception, these people, what's the perception of value that's being provided? And I'm not... Manny Casamata, Storm Financial, to seeing how much the koala can bear and just writing it up as much as I can. Get me, don't get me like that. I'm simply saying, what do your clients value? Yeah, 100%. and this is where the business side of it comes in, because there are a lot of advisors trying to run a business as compared to a lot of businessmen trying to run advisory practices. And um, I'm, I'm finding now that our average age of our advisor coming to us is they're usually under 40. They're thinking business wise. They can't repeat the careers that those who went before them. They can't make their people work ridiculous hours and build up a client base of C's and D's to become A's and B's, all that garbage from the old days. It's more about how do we collaborate with each client, add significant value and not work ridiculous hours or even not even work in the same office. Do you, um, because if I was to interpret a lot of the stuff we're talking about at the moment, it's obviously this holistic, high touch, high value, high fee advice. Um, With your advisor clients, do you to tell them that this is your core offering and we should work towards that but also have a secondary offering where yeah, so they've it's got, a low they've touch all got, they've all got and let me just touch doesn't mean anything to us I think the old we've still got this product mentality four meetings 6,000 two meetings 3,000 what? 
why is four meetings better than two? <laughs> you know, it's, you're digging four holes rather than two. I only needed one. You know, and I think this whole we still attach activity to value. High touch. I touch you a lot. You've got to have 28 touches. What? Mm. And so I think this more comes from, a, again, a product background or an hourly rate thinking paradigm that says if you're adding significant value, if you know the client more than the client knows themselves and their behaviours and their complexities, and if you can anticipate the effects of legislation for your clients more before they even become, if you well, offer what we call a no surprises approach to the rest of their financial life, as long as they're paying you a sub. And the sub might be a 1000 a a year it doesn't have to be ten thousand, right? But I'm I'm making money on the thousand. I need to make money on every because it client. reflects the complexity. It reflects the complexity. It yep. reflects the value. This isn't about a oh, stackable's only goal for the twenty five thousand dollar client. That's, sure, that's garbage. Right. Yep. By people who I think who are still stuck in that. My clients are different. You know, they're mums and dads. They haven't got a lot to live on. They've got an allocated pension. They're yes. whatever. I think I think get rid of the paradigm and just start think about. Let's test one client, two client, five clients, fifty clients. What do they value? And what are they willing to pay to get access to you so that they can live more confidently in their lives? That's super interesting. Yeah, because I, if I think about it the way that I used to do in terms of engagement, it would be I have these packages and uh, I talk to you and I think you need these services, so I'll plonk you into this package and then I'll give you an upfront SOA. Whereas you're sort of t- taking it from a uh, the the seat of knowledge so to speak like you're coming to me and basically you're going to pay me to solve your financial problems and then depending on how complex they are will just simply reflect the fee that's right i think it's we we talk about access pricing or retainer based pricing for you to pick up a pen and take on any client in the past we've sort of priced upon oh it's only a tax return or or it's just a rollover and, and I, we still need those advisors that'll do that sort of work. Don't 100%. get me wrong. We still need those guys and girls. Who can, and I call it the knee surgery stuff. We still need knee surgeons. But I'm not going to keep paying a knee surgeon. I've only got two knees. <laughs> so I think it's, you know, I think it's, I'm not going to get a renewal income. But I still want 80% of my clients to come back. And so, I, not 100%, but 80%. So it's more, who do you want to deal with? What work do you really like doing? And okay, there's going to be some, the work is still hard. You've still got to be there for the hard advice and deliver it the hard advice. You've still got to give advice, not easy advice, like jump in the market when it's booming. It's easy stuff. You know, the hard advice when to do things which is contrary to 35 years of habits or thinking or collaboration. Yeah. And I've still got to earn the stuff and I can't take it for granted. But I want to make sure I can build a system that my 25-year-old can do it as well as I can, even if I'm 55, not because they've got grey hair, because they're going through a similar methodology to say, hey, Clayton, what's of value to you? Hey, Clayton, what's, what's the situation you're in? And I'm not going to act, act like a smarty pants at 25 to a 55. Sure. But, but I'll do it respectfully. Yeah. To really under, what this is what's of value to you. And if the 25 doesn't know the estate plan or the Section 7As or doesn't know the ETF or the SMA or whatever, I can get people to do that. And I'm not saying let 25-year-olds run loose, but I am saying the methodology in thinking that I've got to have grey here, I've got to have experience in products or knowledge or tax, will still need the knee surgeon. But I think we're even into an era of what is really, really like a project manager of sorts. Yeah. People's financial lives. That makes sense. So uh, so if you're talking about the ability to scale uh, uh, the, the service of solving complexity, then one of the best things I've heard about great advice is the ability to ask great questions. So my guess is that your clients learn how to ask great questions? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's you've got to ask great questions, no question. Um, you've got to, I think, and we just did a session this morning, it, it, it's, it's more about probing into areas that clients probably haven't been probed into. We talk about your client ideally should have a discovery every single year about why I'm engaging you. Ooh. The client should rediscover, mm, okay, yeah, you're right. I That's done. a really good KPI for Because quite, quite often it's, it's, they've generally called the first meeting with the client a discovery for the advisor to discover, and we think it's the wrong way. I think, no, the client's got to discover. You've made me discover something about my behaviours or my attitude towards money or mm. to my, my behaviours internally or to the issues on how I've addressed them. 
you've discovered or I've discovered something about the significant other I've been living with for 20 years that I never really knew until you started opening up these conversations. And we had really good conversations after. And it wasn't because I just asked smart questions. It's because I was just simply, I had a real smart focus, which I really want to understand individually, as I said before, your unique certainty and your unique complexity, which is quite often means I've got to get one member of the capital to shut up while I listen to the one that's never really talked about this stuff before. And they voice things that... And I'm not looking for that emotional moment with the tissues and saying, I've got them, it's, it's more... <laughs> really, if we're going to work together and why are you going to pay my fee, is it what do you really consider to be valuable this year? And regardless of what you Whoa, paid last year. Good question. And I think that's... Uh, but Clayton, great advisors have been doing this for years. Yeah. And yeah. they do a really good engagement, but then they've come back to, okay, now I've got you to sign the ROA or the SOA, and this is how I get my money, you've got to transfer this fund from it. And they're, oh, my God. Oh, no. Because it's come from that product or hourly rate mentality. Yeah. And we're just saying there's no product needed for six months or eight months. It doesn't matter when there's product needed. Yeah. But you deserve to get paid for the value you're adding today. Yeah. Which is helping people make smarter decisions with their money. I don't want to lock them in. They can pull out after a quarter or six months or whatever. It's not locked in and you know, press hard three copies before 30 June sort of garbage. <laughs> I've, seen, uh, I've seen a lot of really good advisors recently try to make all of their – uh, product recommendations, whether their investment, super insurance, you know, whatever, as simple as possible, uh, in order to um, not attach, almost specifically, not attach any of their value to those complexities of the product. What do you? How do you feel about that? Uh, if it's we 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 are pretty big on putting the client's life on a single page. So if you go to any single advi- any certainty advisor you'll be presented with what we call an advice map, which really hopefully on a single page for every client, no matter what the complexity, here's where we're going, here's what we're going to get over, here's our priorities we need to attack this year, and here's your priorities that you're going to do some work on each year. But everything on this page is your whole geography. So try to make it as simple as possible. Reduce it to pictures, in our opinion, or a map. We, we're met fans of mind mapping, and we picked this up in the U.S., 20 years ago we didn't invent it and then the advice path came from advisor Dave Murdoch down there in Melbourne Paxton Bridge you know talking about let's put it graphically over seven years it's just here's the path and it's only a PowerPoint but it's, it tries to match here's when we turn on the cash flow stuff or the allocated pension or the retirement or the super and here's when you should get those outcomes of the holiday home or the holiday or looking after the kids or aged parents and here's where we've got to get through some of these hard bits about you two collaborating better as a couple and just, so we put complexities, we put objectives, we put strategies, we, just to try and make it simple. Um, and then it, it's sort of like, behind the scenes, yeah, there's probably tons of complexity and tons of negotiation with different specialists on really complex cases um, with different experts. But it's just like surgery, I guess. I don't want to get too much into that detail. I, just, I really want the outcome. Now, some clients are forced to get into that detail because they think I better protect myself here and bring in my own experts. Yep. But I think that's again coming off the back of 30 years of product domination as compared to expertise on solving the problem. I just want to go to a master builder or a master advisor that helps bring this together. And I want it for a thousand bucks a year or 50,000 based upon you know, the complexity of my demand. Um, I wouldn't mind asking you about uh, valuation of businesses of the clients you've worked with. Um, not not in terms of dollars, just in terms of uh, what you've seen do well. One of the things that Andrew mentioned uh, was that there's a lot of um, f- external money from Australia that is looking to purchase into off-market um, financial planning businesses. And the, the number that he legitimately said was 10, uh, 10 times revenue, which just blew... Revenue or EBITDA? Oh, sorry, EBITDA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and which blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. And I think that's a very, very good uh, multiple. They're product shops, though. Well, okay, and this is what I was going to ask you. So uh, is this is this based on service? Because uh, what we're talking about is very much service-based rather than product we've, based. we've had firms go at eight, eight, eight plus. Is that right? Eight plus EBITDA. With, with, with service? With soft, so I don't service. Primarily because I'm picking up systems, I'm picking up people, I'm picking up precedents, I'm picking up niches, I'm picking up reputation in niches. Um, I don't have to invent this stuff. I've also got another non-niche, non-precedent um, base that I can merge in with this and get 
significant more value and we've seen that a couple of times and it's only a couple of times these are really early days sure um, I would still say the premiums AMP's pull out of Bollard was just there goes the underwriter of all valuations in Australia thank God uh, because it was buy, it's buy a first resort it wasn't ever buy a last resort and it was, an, it was an internal buy that I could buy it at four times sell it on to some other person coming out of the AMP Horizons Academy at three times and then they'll stay for 20 years anyway so it was a really totally inflated market I think thank God they're gone they're still overinflated I think but hopefully no AMP people listen to this <laughs> yeah I think I think probably the caveat is it's good for the industry but obviously sucks for them oh well I, but I, I think yeah look those, I, I do not know how AMP is going to remediate those guys who have actually bought it four times well uh, I interviewed Neil McDonald he's the, oh, yeah. he's the yeah. head of the AMP I saw yeah. that on your list uh, if you listen to that podcast, yeah. it sounds like uh, they've got a pretty good class action case. So time will tell. Yeah. All, all I'm getting at is that I think external parties coming in on a big institutional basis, they want they want platform, they want space. Um, and this is where I think the weakness of Standard 3 with Fascia is because it will still enable firms to build their own white label pro- platform that by itself is not significantly extra money as per the wording, not significantly extra money in revenue flow, but it's huge valuation from a balance sheet perspective. 100%. And it's conflicted. Yeah. Totally conflicted. Well, it's, uh, it, it is, but we don't like to talk about it in those terms. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, and again, that's the other thing with certain advice. No perceived or real conflict on the yeah, advice. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No white labeling. No, no, um, no commissions, no, no kickback, no rent assistance. It's just... I only get paid by one person, you, Mr. and Mrs. Klein. It's very. Is, is that similar to the... Um, I'm pretty sure they've got the same name as we do, XY Planning Network in uh, the US. Don't know. Yeah, it's sort of similar. It's no, no, uh, no commissions. And, um, so ha- what percentage of advisors do you think could actually move into this style? 80%, of I think 80% could. Because I, I still come back to 80% got in the business to look after people, not look after. You know, they prefer to stare at people rather than stare at screens. And I still think they could, if they fundamentally take the leap of faith, um, my, my advice is valuable. Yeah. My advice is valuable. I, I, I won't do it overnight. I'm not going to do it next year. I'll do it over the next three to four years. It's a transition. Um, the new ones that are starting out, we're saying this is the best of times to be testing this stuff. Absolute best of times. You look back on this like the PC's just been invented. It's 1979. The world's still running around on hardware. You know, the hardware guys are going. They're dead. They, they can't. They can't remake their model. They're getting paid not to understand the value model pro- proposition that's based on product. It is weird, and it, and because you know, I started my uh, company, which I no longer have, but I started it in the last days of June of two thousand and thirteen, like literally just before Fofa uh, came in. And even though I'd come from a personal tax uh, accountant background. Right, where I was 100% used to uh, charging a service-based fee um, and then spending uh, almost a year at Dixon Advisory in the uh, the SIS team, not the uh, investment team. So, uh, yes, everyone pretty much walked out with a SMSF, but uh, we did learn a lot about um, superannuation. Um, and certainly in the team that I was in, there was no commissions. Um, so I'd sort of come through that uh, as a power plan at, at Dixon. And then um, I ended up 12 months in Horizons. And that's where I kind of, uh, oh, no, it was Dixon as well, I guess, because everyone needed to, everyone was all about moving the money, right? And so by the time I'd done a year at Dixon and a year at AMP, I just didn't consider anything else other than okay you become a client and then you get an SOA and we do we do the thing um, but look and I think I think, I think that's knee surgery I think we still need knee surgeons we yeah, still need yeah. people to put out really good SMSFs we still need really good specialists on ETFs and estate planning but yeah. it's knee surgery and as compared to uh, a relationship with someone that regardless if it's knee elbow head or whatever yeah what's the best possible path for you for the next 12 months regardless yeah. if you need knee surgery or not yeah so we still need the specialists i want but yeah yep. i'm not trying to decry that yes i'm simply saying the position that's going vacant at the moment is who's the general practitioner for getting paid for quality advice whether there's a product or not well yeah and and i think the fact that 
I was more comfortable charging or telling my clients they were charged a certain fee because it was a product and then I was receiving money via them I don't know why I felt more comfortable with that rather than just charging more for my advice like Mm. it doesn't it actually doesn't make any sense it's if you're my client telling you that you have to pay that and then oh that thing pays me that's actually more complicated than it needs to be again this whole thing rather than just like that's just been the way it is hey like you pay me and then I help you. Like, that's actually a and easier it's, conversation. And it's not a leap. It's, everyone looks at it as a bit of a cavern, a bit of a, it's too, too big a chasm for me to jump over. It's not. It's not. It's, it's, it's additional complexity. Spot on. And, but for whatever reason, it, despite my background, I was completely convinced that that was that the right way to do it. There's people out there paid for you not to believe it's easy to do, if that makes sense. Because yeah, you've got to push no. my product in place and yeah. we'll give you a better cut or you push my product in place and it's yeah. got X, Y attached. Great, yeah. I'll take that product. Yeah. We aren't car dealers, you know. We're not yeah. selling. We're actually trying to help people go from A to B. Maybe they don't even need a car. And, and especially because, I mean, investment products and super products, they don't have commissions attached to them anymore. And yet, still, the behavior is so hardwired that we just feel that uh it, it's changing though it's changing oh yeah i mean with conversations like this i mean i haven't heard this too often i think i've only probably had one conversation in my life where it w- it became clear that the person was not providing an soa up front and That's- how long have you been talking about this well look i picked it up working with great accountants in the 80s you know we started doing this <laughs> 1989 you know, so we gave the first agent as a business person's course up at Coolink out of Green Mount Resort, not fourth of <laughs> November, nineteen eighty nine. And, and amongst that crew, you're saying, guys, you've got to get off LRH. You know, you got to get off. And that's when tax deduction, three thousand dollars of superannuation was tax deductible immediately. So just take it in, off you go, boys. Happy days. And so, I just think, despite all the changes, everything, everything holds new again. And but, the unintended consequences of too much reaction got to make it affordable, got to watch out for robo-advice, you've got to get faster credit. It's taking our eyes further off the ball, talk to clients that value you and make sure you put a price on that that gives you fair reward, keeps the majority of them um, and enables you to deliver, yeah. whether there's a product attached or not. Yeah. And we call these strategy papers, right? This is the term that, yeah, that I, I just, see. Yeah, I think that's why we it's just advice. It's just plain vanilla advice. Yeah. It's helping someone with complexity go through A to B with more confidence. Yeah, <laughs> the, the the words you use make it sound look, and it's not a very word, simple. Yeah, it's not a wordsmith thing. It's just it's just authentic value, and everyone's got to put their own fingerprints on it. It's not a script. We're not fans of the American approach to learn a script off by heart. It's not a religion. It's simply I just what's in the client's fundamental best interest. What's their best path? Here's the price for that. I I want you, I'd love you to come on board, but if it's too expensive, I get it. That's okay. Yeah, uh, they're probably cheaper elsewhere. I'm not trying to compete on price. It's just got to be valuable to you. And next year's fee, it's got to be valuable to you. I don't know what it is, but it's got to be valuable to you. you it know? is one of the weird things about advice that um, you can go to two, three, four, five, ten different advisors, and you'll get something really different across the whole spectrum. Do you think that's something that? can change over time or do you think it, it, uh, there's still, healthiness in that i still think it, when you look at sort of the premiums or just know you look at some of the advisors who specialize in certain niches and they've got a way with with farmers or they've got a way with um double income no kids yet or they've got a way with pre-retirees in a certain regional area and, and i think we're always going to have unique complexities and unique certainties to search for and we'll have therefore quite unique methodologies in our firms that deliver on that so yeah. no, I, I think you can put 11 economists in a room and get 15 opinions. And I think to a certain extent, that's the beauty of it. It's not Coca-Cola formula, pump it out the same all over the world. Yeah. The uniqueness is your methodology, not the output, because I think we all want to, we all like different things, different clients. And it can be taken to this, 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 because I hate the term high net worth. It can be taken to any worth, provided they see value. Yeah. Uh, one of the specialities that I worked with was uh, I think it was my, my friend Naomi Christopher told me uh, uh, Henry it was a high earner not rich yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure and I was like That's yeah you know I, I had you know a lot of uh, 
young adults in their 20s, they were actually most of the time working in finance. They just didn't understand personal finance, they understood corporate finance. And then they didn't understand that psychology and that uh, the emotional attachment to money. And that was kind of my job. So, mm. um, mate, I wanted to thank you for coming in. Pleasure. Because it's been a real, it's been a great conversation. Thanks, Claire. Um for advisors that are sitting there and want to reach out, learn more about what you do, I know you've got an online portal. Yeah. Um, what, can you let us... Uh, advicegroup.com um, is, our, is our site. Um, we're running our, running our first advisor conference, Certainty Advisor Conference next May. Awesome. May, May 14. Very it's it's going to be open. Because we want to... And, and rather than getting the head of X Bank or Y ASIC or, or Z Institution, we're getting advisors up who are on this journey, not saying they're... They're, they're superstars. They're simply authentically talking in probably 10 to 12 different TED, TED Talk style days with a panel about, you know, how I went across to retainers or how I got off hourly rates or how I converted a model that keeps the majority of my clients without even knowing what the proposition is next year. So we want to get advisors talking to advisors who are on the journey, whether they've been doing it for five months or 15 years with us, um, and have that as a bit of a forum which people could come to. And we'll release a research paper just before it so we're we're pretty excited. It's 14 May next year. We haven't we're going to put save the dates out. So sensational. Mm. I'd, I'd love to love you to get you come get you to come along and see what you think of it. Man, I'd love to come along. Awesome. Well, thanks for thanks for coming on the podcast. Pleasure. Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate.